Hi, everyone. We are so excited that you've joined us today for an insightful conversation about fair housing. My name is Talia Galaviz, realtor with my home group and a proud member of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee here at the Arizona Association of Realtors. I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we kick things off, just a couple of notes for you. Please be sure to remain on mute for the duration of the presentation. And if you have a question or would like to engage in the discussion, please use the hand raise feature or the chat box to submit your questions. There will be a Q&A segment at the end of the presentation and our guest speaker will answer all of your questions during that time. Okay, now I am pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Nate Johnson. Nate is the president of Real Estate Solutions Group at Red Key Realty Leaders, the largest independent real estate brokerage in St. Louis, Missouri. In addition to representing buyers and sellers, Nate serves in an agent development role at his brokerage, coaching, e coaching and training agents. He has been a proud member of the St. Louis Association of Realtors since 1999. Nate has been speaking to groups around the country for over a decade and is passionate about helping people become the best version of themselves through teaching and training. Nate is a certified instructor for the National Association of Realtors and instructs on a variety of topics, including fair housing, code of ethics, business planning, and leadership. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Nate Johnson for his presentation Focus on Fair Housing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for, um, for, um, for having me. I'm looking forward to having the conversation with you today. Let me, uh, let me share my screen real quick and I will get right into it. So what I recognize is that, you know, in order for us to really understand where we're at in terms of today's society and how it relates to, uh, to um, diversity and inclusion, we really have to understand where we've been. And that only when we understand where we're at today and where we've been, are we gonna be able to identify the steps that we need to take to move forward in terms of creating equitable communities all over our country. So with that, let's jump right in. We're gonna go and take a little bit of a history lesson. We're gonna go back in time. So 1865, anybody remember 1865? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you, a couple of you remember? So what we know was happening there was we had the we had the Civil War. The Civil War was ending. The Emancipation Proclamation, and we our country was torn apart. So the question becomes: What are we going to do with our country, and how are we going to heal it? And you know, President Lincoln at the time said, "With malice towards none and charity for all, let's heal the nation's wounds." And that's what he looked to do because we had to determine what, we were, what was going to happen with all of the freed men and women who were once slaves in our country. So all these people were just out, you know, looking for opportunities and what opportunities would they have? So President Lincoln dispatched his general, General George Tecumseh Sherman. And General Sherman went and spoke with uh, a gentleman by the name of Garrison Frazier. Garrison Frazier was a former slave and who was kind of a spokesperson for the freedmen and women at the time. And he asked a very important question. And by asking a question, that was pretty remarkable considering the times. He's talking to somebody who was just owned by someone not long ago and asking them a question about what they want for their people. What is it that you want, he asks. What do you want for your people? And Garrison Frazier said that, you know, he said that, you know, we need land. The best way that we can take care of ourselves is to have land, to turn it and to till it by our own labor. And then we can soon maintain it ourselves and we can maintain ourselves and have something to spare. We're able to build homes and um, businesses and be integrated into society, basically is what Garrison Frazier said. And that all made a whole lot of sense to George Tecumseh Sherman. So he took that back to President Lincoln as well. President Lincoln said, well, let's do this. So what was issued was what we call special field order number 15. And what it said was this, the islands from Charleston South 
the abandoned rice fields along the river for 30 miles back from the sea and the country bordering the St. John's River in Florida are reserved and set apart for the settlement of Negroes now made free by acts of war and by the proclamation of the President of the United States. So there we have it. We know that as special field order number 15 and it says right there, all this land, we may have, you may have heard of that as 40 acres and a mule. So each family was supposed to get 40 acres, but the mule wasn't really a part of it. But that's how we kind of have learned to uh, have grown to learn about this particular field order that was issued by the president at the time. So we were on our way. And by we, I mean, we as a society, we had figured out what we were going to do to sort of start to create some opportunities for the recently emancipated people in our country. Unfortunately, that didn't last very long because as we know, President Lincoln had a really rough night at the theater. And as a result, that brought in the presidency of Andrew Johnson. Now, Andrew Johnson had a completely different view of how to deal with the former enslaved people. Let them fend for themselves. We're not giving them any land. What are you talking about? So he repealed special field order number 15 and gave the land uh, back to the former, um, uh, the plantation owners who formerly owned it. And that went away with special field order 15. But we still had a challenge, of course. We still had to figure out what rights are these folks gonna have in this country? So it was Congress who then in 1866 brought forth the Civil Rights Bill. And the Civil Rights Bill in 1866 said that such citizens of every race and color without regard of any previous condition of involuntary servitude or slavery shall have the same rights in every state and territory to own, convey, lease, sell, hold real and personal property as is enjoyed by white citizens. So there we have it. They sent this to the president's desk, he vetoed it. They sent it to the president's desk a second time. He vetoed it a second time. And it wasn't until there was a two thirds majority vote by Congress that the civil rights bill became law. The president never signed it, but it did in fact become law. So there we have it, 1866, housing discrimination over, racism in America has ended. That's it. We're good, everybody agree with that? No? No? Yeah. Okay. We didn't quite solve the problems in 1866, of course, but we had reconstruction starting to take place. Reconstruction was taking place, uh, working to, you know, we had the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment passed, uh, constitutional amendments passed, and that was working to sort of create more equal opportunities for all members of our society. And in fact, in 1870, we saw the first congressman, uh, Senator Hiram Revels of Mississippi, and Representative Joseph Rainey from South Carolina. They became the first African Americans to serve in Congress. It was pretty phenomenal. This is 1870. And in fact, there was another senator who was sent to Congress just a couple of years later, and of uh, several more uh, state uh, US representatives as well. And we were on our way. We were on our way as a country coming together and giving equitable opportunities to everyone. Unfortunately, that didn't really last for very long because although we saw two senators uh, by 1880 and eight representatives serving at one time in the House by 1880, it would be about another 100 years before we would see the next U.S. senator come to, uh, come to Congress and 100 years before we would see more than, eight, you know, more than half a dozen uh, U.S. representatives, African American U.S. representatives in Congress, and why was that? You know, what caused that? What what happened? Well, what we know is that President uh, Rutherford B. Hayes came. Uh, he was the Republican governor from Ohio, and he was running against the Democratic governor in New York. And what was happening there is there was a lot of contention about. Who was going to win this race? Who was going to emerge victorious in, in this election? Um, and Rutherford B. Hayes, in his wisdom, said, you know what? Let me talk to some folks. So he talked to the leaders of the southern states that were 
having some re that were unreconstructed and that were experiencing reconstructed and said this, tell you what, if you support me and I become your president, then I will remove all of the prep federal troops from the South and I'll let you do what you feel is best to handle the integration of, um, of, of former slaves into your population. I know you'll do the right thing. So that worked. The Southerners supported him. The Southern leaders supported him. And we know this is the compromise of 1877. Rutherford B. Hayes was elected president and he did exactly what he said he was gonna do. He removed all the federal troops from the South and this effectively ended reconstruction. And in the words of Frederick Douglass, the freedmen were left naked unto their enemies. And that's what was happening. That's where we were at. So now we're in a space where all of the uh, recently enslaved African-Americans had the rights that they were been given stripped away once again. And this ushered in the Jim Crow era in the South. So African-Americans were looking for greener pastures up north because that's where they thought the promised land was. And, you know, as they made their way, we see by 1910, over 90% of African-Americans lived in the, in the South. And just about 50 years later, that number was cut in half. So you saw this great migration make, make its way north to sort of look for more opportunity. Now, the challenge that was run into at that time was us. They ran into us. And by us, I mean the National Association of Real Estate Boards, who of course became the National Association of Realtors, us as realtors. We, in 1924, amended our code of ethics. We amended our code of ethics to say this, on Article 34, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or any individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in the neighborhood. So this is us. This is what we did in 1924. Now, I say what we did. Some of you may be saying, well, I wasn't even, I wasn't even here. You know, I didn't do that. That was them. But, you know, and, and others may be thinking, I wouldn't have even been able to be a member of our association at that time. But nonetheless, we all benefit and we all suffer as a result of the decisions and the policies that were in place 100 years ago. And that's what we have to be aware of because we, our association, our organization was responsible for so much of this. We have to take ownership of it. I mean, we're the ones that are responsible for correcting it and making amends and doing what we can to create the future that our uh, communities deserve. So we run into the 1930s. Now, what was happening in the 1930s? The Civil War, the Civil War, of course not the Civil War. We already talked about the Civil War. It is the Great Depression. The Great Depression was happening in the 1930s. So that's another challenge that the African-Americans ran into as they were making their way north from the South because our economy was in the tank and it was very rough times out there. So what we, ran, what we saw here was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying, hey, look, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He was talking about the recession. He was talking about our economy at the time. People were in line for soup. It was terrible conditions for most Americans. And, you know, we saw the, the sort of prosperity that was taking shape in Europe. And people were wondering if our fragile democracy was worth preserving, if this experiment was something that was going to sustain. And what the thought leader said is that, you know what we need to do? We need to create more opportunities for home ownership. Because at the time, in the 30s, less than 50% of the population owned a home. It was about 30, 35% owned homes in the 1930s. And then we saw through the New Deal and other programs, the creation of the National Housing Act. The National Housing Act was passed in 1934 and it created the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, of course, which we know um, makes credit available and lending avail insures mortgages for lenders to help make credit more available for consumers in terms of home ownership. But in 1934, home ownership wasn't necessarily something that was on everybody's mind. 
because it was reserved more for the sort of uh, more wealthy folks, not your everyday person. And we saw here these things. Uh, we would see pay rent to yourself. Under FHA, you can own your own home. The happiness and wisdom of home ownership. Those are some of the things that we saw in terms of FHA. Now, that was great because what we saw is if we fast forward another 30, 40 years, we've doubled the rate of home ownership in our nation by doing that. And it was good, but it wasn't great for everyone because by the time we get to 1968, whether the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act was, less than 2% of mortgages, FHA mortgages were issued to African-Americans and other minorities. So that was a huge challenge. So what we saw is that a lot of members of our society were able to take advantage of home ownership opportunities. And there were so many of us that were left behind. And that really worked to sort of create this racial wealth gap that exists today in communities all over the country. And FHA and VA, for that matter, um, they, they put this in policy. They put it in the neighborhood documents, or excuse me, their underwriting manual. Here's the underwriting manual from the Federal Housing Administration from 1938. And what it says is this, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social class that, and, and by the same social class, social and racial classes. A change in social and racial occupancy generally contributes to instability and a decline in values. So this was the FHA manual. And it went on to say recorded deed restrictions should strengthen and supplement zoning ordinances and to be really effective should include the provisions listed below. The restrictions should be recorded with the deed and should run for about at least 20 years. And the recommended restrictions include the following. Prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they are intended. So this was our FHA. This was government policy that was written and implemented that really worked to segregate our communities and keep them segregated. And that's what sort of leads us to where we're at today. But if we look at some of the things that we did as Realtors, this is a homeowner loan corporation map. We were the people that were drawing these maps. We as Realtors drew these maps and we call these redlining maps. Redlining, of course, denying or restricting loans to or in a particular community. And what we saw here is that we would create these maps and we would identify areas of being dangerous or hazardous. And then we would have the best areas. And what FHA would do, they would implement what we would draw and where we said um, they shouldn't be lending money. And they didn't lend money in those neighborhoods. So as you could imagine, a lot of those neighborhoods that they that they redlined were African-American and other minority neighborhoods. So as a result, there was no opportunity for wealth creation through home ownership in a lot of these neighborhoods. And it wasn't just the Midwest, this is Los Angeles. It was also taking place in the East. This here is, you see the city of uh, Buffalo, and this is the Evans Bank trade area. Now their map was a little different because the red area was the part of town that they would lend money, but then the blue areas were greater than 50% African-American or greater than 40% African-American. And, you know, Evans Bank would not lend money. They weren't trading in those areas because FHA was not insuring mortgages in those areas. So it was a huge problem and it really created a lot of challenges in our communities. Um, we would see these signs all over. We want white tenants in our white community. Uh, Christians only, Jews not welcome, no Irish, no Blacks, no dogs. Yes, no Irish, because you may not be aware, but Irish were heavily discriminated when they first came over as first and second generation Americans. Italians as well. In fact, most immigrant groups that came to our country experienced this level of discrimination, and they were akin to people of color when they first landed on our shores. However, over the course of a couple of generations, we saw Irish, Italian, and others sort of get assimilated into um, white society, if you will. And that sort of changed the trajectory of 
who was given opportunities and who had opportunities withheld from them. Because when we look a little bit further, we know that one of the reasons why maybe some of this integration took place at a higher level is because of the integration of the military. Now, African-Americans uh, were not, uh, were still segregated in the military. So when World War II came, uh, came upon our, uh, came to us and we, and we were segregated. So Irish and uh, Italians worked with, uh, worked alongside everyone else. So when they came back home from war, they were able to buy homes and become neighbors of everyone else too. But with the exception, again, people of color were not able to have those opportunities. Now, what we see here is a restrictive covenant, a racially based restrictive covenant. It says none of the said lands, interest therein or improvements therein shall be sold, resold, conveyed, or used in any person in any way or occupied by any person of Negro blood or to any person of the Semitic race whose racial description shall include Armenians, Jews, Hebrews, Persians, and Syrians. We know that as a restrictive covenant and those were all over the country that really became the model uh, for housing development. And that leads us to, this is Levittown, New York, 1947. This development was first taking reservations in 1945 in New York. And what was happening in 1945, of course, were the soldiers were coming home from war. World War II was ending. And this is where a lot of people had an opportunity to get to know each other and get to meet each other in terms of living as neighbors. But although Jews, African-Americans, Asians, Hispanics helped to build these homes in Levittown, none of them were occupied by any uh, because of those restrictive covenants. And this was an FHA financed project and FHA was not lending money into integrated neighborhoods. So that's one of the reasons why this couldn't happen. William Levitt, who was Jewish himself, uh, Levitt and Sons who created Levittown. And there's a half a dozen Levittowns on the East Coast. He would not sell homes to Jews, even though he, was, he himself were, was Jewish. Um, he said, look, We've got a housing problem and a racial problem. I'm going to solve the housing problem. And that's what he did. That's what he did in many ways for many people. But again, not for everyone. Not for everyone. So that leads us to 1948. 1948, we've got the Shelley versus Kramer decision. Picture here is Thurgood Marshall, uh, later became Supreme Court Justice. He worked on this case. Now, what was happening here is that the Shelley family wanted to buy a home and the, uh, uh, their attorney, uh, they wanted to, their, their attorney helped make that a reality for them because he wrote his name on the contract, their white attorney. So, and then at closing, the Shelley family took ownership of it. But then when they moved in, the Kramer family had a problem with it. They said, hey, we've got these restrictive covenants. You can't live here. You can't occupy this home. So as a result, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said this. They said, racially based restrictive covenants on their face are not invalid under the 14th Amendment, and they may be privately enforced. However, there will be no state or judicial action to enforce such a restrictive covenant. So what does that mean? That means that if neighbor A says, you know what, I'm gonna sell my home to anybody who can afford it, then he or she may do so without any repercussion. And also the person who buys that home isn't going to have any repercussions either. It also means that neighbor B says, no, I'm only gonna sell my home to white families because that's what my restrictive covenants say. Then there will be no um, judicial or state action to um, discipline or, uh, or, or, or punish that person for um, advancing discrimination. So what we know, of course, is that there was police action. There was state action that worked to, that worked to uphold these restrictive covenants. Because just imagine if you know, uh, the African-American family moves in and um, the local sheriff lives on that block. And he may not be a fan of integration. You don't think that there's going to be some state or judicial action occurring in that neighborhood? How about if the local judge, who's not in favor 
of integration or prominent and influential businessman. Yeah, there's going to be some state action. We all know that, and there was a lot. So the Supreme Court made a decision, and it moved it, it moved fair housing in the right direction, but it certainly didn't solve it because it left way too many holes. And what I'll share with you is that laws and policies are great, but unless we change the hearts and minds of people, then we're going to have the same challenges because people are going to always find a way around a law or a policy. And we really have to make sure that we're educating each other so that we can create, uh, so that we can make better decisions and in, in in integrate our communities all around the country. So that was 1948. So then we, that brought in 1949. And in 1949, um, we saw the Housing Act, which which um, which created uh, slum clearance and urban redevelopment. So one of the challenges is that we had all of these people of color that were forced into certain pockets of communities. And that's where they were relegated to because they weren't able to rent houses or buy houses outside of those pockets. So as a result, they were there. These areas became um, slum-like conditions because they were overcrowded um, they lacked in investment for infrastructure and those sorts of things. Um, they were things were in these neighborhoods that no one would ever want in their own neighborhood, and as a result, they really declined. So the housing the Housing Act worked to clear up some of these slums and urban renewal, as it was called, often dubbed Negro removal, uh, because they were really breaking up these communities and folks didn't have other places to go. They really didn't. And that sort of ushered in the era of the high rise, the high rise public housing units. And these high rise public housing units, this is Pruitt Igo, first occupied in 1954. Half of it were was was developed for African Americans and other minorities. And the other half was for white families. And public housing at the time was viewed much differently. It was supposed to be a way to give folks a hand up and not a hand out. People were supposed to um, you know, get on their feet and go and buy a house or rent a house, which was great if you had the ability to do so. But because the communities were so segregated and there were so, such limited opportunities for people of color that they stayed in these housing developments where the white families were able to move out and find better opportunities. And once the white families moved out of these neighborhoods, all of a sudden you see a lack of investment in police presence, the infrastructure's crumbling, you've got the elevators not working, the HVAC system you know, not reliable, things like that was occurring. Now, I wanna back up for a moment because I talked about Levittown and there's an important thing that I need to highlight about Levittown because there were opportunities for African-Americans and people of color to buy homes. However, it was not in places like Levittown. It were places across the tracks, so to speak. And Levittown was very affordable. The homes in Levittown cost in 1945 dollars about $8,000, which is twice the median income average for our nation. And that's about $100,000 in today's dollars. Now, we fast forward and Today, those homes in those neighborhoods in Levittown are selling for three to four to five hundred thousand dollars. Now, as I stated, African Americans and other minorities were able to purchase homes, not in Levittown. They were able to buy the homes that were on the other side of the tracks, so to speak. The same pricing was available for them, but again, a lack of infrastructure improvements. Uh, the, the building quality wasn't as, as good. They would allow things to come into those neighborhoods that no one would want in their own neighborhood. Um, you know, the authorities would allow the liquor stores to move in. They would allow the pig farm to be right next to it. They would run the highway through it. All of these things would happen, and that would really work to destroy values in those communities. So, whereas today, when the properties in Levittown are selling for four and five hundred thousand dollars. The properties in the communities where African Americans were able to purchase homes are selling for about $100,000, which in essence means that over the period of 50, 70 years, you've got little to no wealth accumulation or appreciation in those neighborhoods. And that's important to recognize because when we look at, when, when we look at 
you know, when we look at how that affects us, it's like monopoly. Because if you look at, if you say that, well, 1968, the Fair Housing Act was passed, so everybody had an opportunity to buy homes in whatever na neighborhood they wanted to. Even if that was true, which we know it isn't, but even if it were true, what about, you know, what happened during that whole period when these houses started to gain value and, you know, they became unaffordable is what happened. They became unaffordable for African-Americans and others. Imagine playing Monopoly. We're all realtors. We play Monopoly. So what in this example, what happens is you allow for the five other players in the game to go around the board three or four times before you're ever able to leave. And what's going to happen in Monopoly? We know you're going to have limited opportunities to buy real estate because everybody's bought all the good property. And that good property, people are starting to build houses on it, put hotels on it. So now it costs a lot more to even land on those properties. You'd be lucky to even get Baltic and Mediterranean Avenue at that point, all right? That's what's going to happen. And so imagine some folks had not three to four to five turns, but they had 30, 40, 70, 80, 100 years to go around that board. So that's where the opportunities are so limited. And that's what really creates the wealth gap that exists among different races within our country. So we were talking about, we were talking about these public high rise, uh, public housing developments that were just terrible. They were terrible. They didn't start that way, but they grew that way. And people were desperate. People were desperate for opportunities. So the African-Americans that lived in these places, they just wanted something better. What, I mean, they, they were desperate. So who was able to take advantage of that desperation? None other than the blockbusters. The blockbusters came in and that's us too. Look at us again showing up because a lot of us as realtors were blockbusters at that time. And we were going into neighborhoods and this is what the blockbuster does. They do two important things. They one, pedal fear. So they go to the white families in the neighborhood and they say, hey, you know what? The Smith family down the street just sold their home to that colored family. You better sell me your house at a discount while you still can, okay? So your average white family was like, oh my gosh, I better do it. I better get out of here while I still can. Now, it's important for us to recognize that we've got to look at the times. Your average uh, white family didn't have any interactions with African-Americans. They didn't work together. They didn't go to school together. So what they knew of African-Americans was what they saw on the television or in the movies, the depictions that they heard and saw their friends, their family, you know, all of those things, which were not very positive. So as a result, they had nothing to believe but those things that have been implanted and, and instilled into them. So as a result, they would give into that fear that the blockbusters were peddling and they would sell those homes to at a discount to the blockbuster. So then the blockbuster would go back go back to these types of neighborhoods and say, hey, guess what? I got a house for you. And remember, African-Americans were desperate for housing at the time because I talked about the slum conditions that they were existing within. And many of them had money, had, you know, would be able to afford to buy something, they just couldn't do it because the opportunities weren't presented to them. But the blockbuster said, here we go. I got some opportunities for you. So I'm gonna sell you this house going to cost you a little more than market, but I'll be able to sell it to you. And, you know, African-American would say, well, you know, FHA is not going to loan me any money, right? Didn't we say that? FHA is not lending money in an integrated community. So because that's the case, the blockbuster is like, oh, no problem. We've got this thing called contract for deed, which we're going to take care of for you. So what was happening is that the blockbusters would, quote, sell these houses using contract for deed for about 80% more than market value, 80% more than market value. And the way the contract for deed works, uh, you know, we know a, a normal amortized mortgage. Um, if we've got a 10 year note, the first year, month we pay a lot of interest, a little principal, and then every month we, you know, that starts to shift a little bit until we get the end, but we're accruing equity every month that we make that payment. That wasn't what was happening with contract for deed. 
because you don't accrue any home equity until you close on the sale of the home at the end. So you'd be making that payment on time every month for nine years. And then, and uh, you know, and then you, you're late one year, one month, or you're getting tripped up because the contract has all these surprise fees and balloon payments and things like that to trip people up and you get tripped up and now you're late on the payment or miss a payment, you're evicted and you got nothing. You're evicted and you've got nothing because you've not accrued any home ownership. Uh, any, you got nothing. And then the blockbuster is able to turn around and sell that property to someone else. That's how blockbusters were working. And there was a Duke University study just a couple of years ago that said that uh, in the 50s and 60s, over three quarters of all homes, all real estate transactions involving African-Americans were contract for deed. And they resulted in a three to four billion dollar loss financial loss, just in Chicago, just in the African-American community in Chicago. So that's where we're at today. These are some of the things that brought us to where we're at today, because that's not very long ago. We're talking about the 50s and the 60s. That's not that long ago at all, at all. So prejudices, it is well known are most difficult to eradicate from the heart whose soul has never been loosened or fertilized by education. They grow there, firm as weeds among rocks. That's what Charlotte Bronte had to say. And that brings us to Levittown. This is a different Levittown, this time in Pennsylvania. So what happened here is uh, William and Daisy Myers moved into Levittown and they're African-American family. They're the first African-American family to move into the neighborhood. They were professionals. Uh, she was a school teacher, I believe. He was an engineer, I think. And well, they're great neighbors, right? And I think that, you know, how do you think that they were welcomed into their neighborhood? I, I mean, I, you know, I would, I would hope that maybe somebody baked them a pie and said, here you go. Welcome to the neighborhood. Let us know if there's anything that we can do to make your move here more welcome. Okay, that's what a good neighbor would do, something like that. But that's not exactly what happened with the Myers family when they integrated Levittown in Pennsylvania. So I want you to take a look at this. This is uh, just a couple quick minutes. This is from a documentary in 1958 called Crisis in Levittown. And we understood that it was going to be all white. We were very happy to buy a home here. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. In what way? I think that, well, the property values will immediately go down if uh, they are allowed to move in here in any number. But there are others who are for the Myers? Yes, I've read about them. For what reason, do you think, do they support the Myers? Frankly, I don't know what reasons they can have for it. If there are homeowners in Levittown, I don't see what reasons they can have for it. Do you think Myers will be able to live here comfortably? Comfortably? No. What course of action are you going to follow? I'll do what I can uh, to help to, to get them out legally and peacefully. And as far as accepting them socially, if that's what you mean, I could never do that. Do you think the Myers will be able to live comfortably in Levittown? I think so. I hope so. I think the majority of people here will uh, grow accustomed to it and uh, realize that, oh, they, are, they can be good neighbors, which I'm sure they are. And uh, I think the majority of people here are not vi the violent, um, well, violent group that we have heard so much about. Yes, so that was Levittown. So what do you think? Pies were delivered? No, no, pies weren't delivered. In fact, they were greeted by two weeks of riots outside their, uh, their front door. Now, let me back up for a second because we had a couple of perspectives. It is easy for us to demonize the first woman who spoke and say, oh my gosh, I cannot believe it. This is terrible. But we have to recognize the times. This is 1957. And as I said before, they don't know anyone else. So they don't have the interaction. Your average white family does not have interaction. So all they are led to believe is what they've learned. And that's where this all this comes. This is all learned behavior 
that we have. And we perpetuate this, um, whether good or bad, it's up to us to make the decision about what we're gonna do. Now, for me, I believe that most of us are more like that second woman, you know, like Anne Frank said, um, despite everything, I believe that most people are good at heart. I do believe that, I, I do. But what I know, is what happens is that that silent majority loses because they allow the vocal minority to win the day. They allow for the people that are spewing that violence and hatred to win the day. Now, what was terrible about this is that, yes, the Myers family had bricks burned or bricks thrown through their windows, uh, terrorized crosses burned in their yards. All of these things were happening. But what was also terrible too is that the second woman who spoke, so she's the type of person that would have baked a pie to deliver and say, you know, look, Myers family, I'm sorry that you're having a hard time here. Here's a pie. We're not all like that. You know, most of us are good neighbors and most of us welcome you into our community. She gives them that pie and they say, thank you. But then what happens is the next day, she is now ostracized from the community. She gets crosses burned in her yard. She gets bricks thrown through her window. So now we've got a different, different level of, you know, of, of, of engagement because the next neighbor who was thinking about baking that pie might think twice because although they don't have any problems with the Myers family, they don't want any problems for themselves. And that's the problem. That's the problem is that people are not willing, not enough of us are willing to stand up for what's right and speak that truth. And because we don't do that, we allow that violent minority to win the day. We allow that violent minority and for everybody to believe that they're the ones that speak for everybody when they don't. Dr. King said about the civil rights movement, this time is not gonna be remembered by the violence and vitriol of all the bad people, but rather by the appalling silence of the good people. And that's right, the appalling silence. And that is true whether it was 1860, 1960, 2022, it's still with us. It's still with us. And we have to be willing to be uh, brave and we have to be willing to be courageous and stand up for what's right and make sure that our voices are heard so that we don't allow that violent and vocal minority to win the day. So that was Levittown. So the Saturday Evening Post, 1959, they wrote an article, When a Negro Moves Next Door. An example of one of these brave folks that I speak about is Estelle Sachs, pictured there in the lower left-hand corner. She's a realtor in Baltimore. And she said, hey, look, we cannot let these blockbusters destroy our communities. We can't give in to them. We need to welcome our, our, our fellow citizens of different races and colors into our neighborhoods. You know, there's value in that. We need to welcome them and not run. That's what she said. And she was effective in many ways, but you know, unfortunately that violent minority who was present ends up winning the day because so many people in the majority remain silent. So here are a few places. Do you recognize where any of these places are? Yeah, that's Arizona. That's Arizona. So there's something more notable about these places and that is that they were known as sundown towns. So a sundown town, whether uh, you know, whether, you know, many of these places may have actually had signs that said, if you're black, and they probably didn't use that word, but if you're black, you better be out of here. Don't let the sun set on you in Prescott, for example. You know, don't let the sun set on you in Globe or Duncan or Scottsdale, whatever. These were the cities in Arizona that it was known, even if they didn't have the signs, that if you're African-American, if you're Jewish, if you're Hispanic in many cases, uh, you better not be found in town after the sun goes down. And that is huge because that perpetuates that sort of uh, segregated communities that were created and, uh, and, and sort of advanced by our federal government and by us as realtors. 
throughout the years. Here's another example. Here's an example of, this is the Rumford Housing Act, the Rumford Fair Housing Act in California. This is the first state in the union to pass fair housing legislation to discriminate, to eliminate, to eliminate illegal discrimination. But guess what? Here we come right afterwards as the California Real Estate Association, we sponsored legislation to overturn the Rumford Fair Housing Act. And in 1964, it was passed. Proposition 14, realtors foster bigotry. That's exactly what we did. That's what we do. Again, this is our association. We have to take ownership of it and we have to make sure that we're doing the things necessary to create positive outcomes. Because if not, we're gonna continue in a trajectory that is not what we want. And we can't allow inertia to happen to change our communities. We have to be proactive because we, you know, inertia has gotten us where we're at, which is segregated communities. Yes, we've achieved some wins, some victories in some parts, but we're never nowhere near where we should be. And we're certainly nowhere near where we would have been had we as realtors not been involved in creating this level of discrimination and hostility. And I love our association. And I can say that because I love our realtor association. I'm a proud realtor. I'm so proud. I, I love it so much that I want us to be better. And we can. We can. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. That's an African proverb. And that leads us to the Watts Rebellion in 1965. Uh, Watts Rebellion, by the way, many folks said that that was a product of Proposition 14. Proposition 14 uh, that we as the realtors passed that caused this uh, civil unrest to occur in Watts, California. Dr. King said, this is environmental and not racial. The economic deprivation, social isolation, Inadequate housing and general despair of thousands of Negro teeming in northern and western ghettos are the ready seeds which give birth to these tragic expressions of violence. And we see it over and over again in our communities. We saw it two years ago, our communities on fire. We saw it in the 70s. We see it all the time and we need to do better. We need to address some of the challenges that cause some of these um, that, that cause some of these uh, adverse outcomes. We have to do that. So Dr. King went to Chicago. He went to Chicago. And when he went to Chicago, he said that he never experienced the type of violence that he experienced when he was in Chicago. And now, of course, he was you know, working on civil rights in Alabama, um, uh, Georgia, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi. And he said that he never experienced the level of violence that he experienced until he got to Chicago. And that's because the Northerners were very happy to wave their finger at the Southerners and say, you've got to treat your Negroes better. But when Dr. King came North and started to pull the curtains back on what was taking place up here, he was met with violence. And they said, no, get back to where you come from. Mind your own business. Because what he found is that the best apartment that he could rent was for $50 a month, a three-room shack three room shack, dark and dingy, poor repair, all of those things. And when he was touring around communities that white families were able to live in, five and six room palatial apartments were available for $40 a month. So not only were African-Americans and other minorities paying a lot more, they were getting a lot less for paying a lot more. And of course we know what happened in 1968, Dr. King was assassinated. And that created an opportunity for Lyndon Johnson who said, never let a good tragedy go to waste. And he used that tragedy to usher in the Civil Rights Act. Now, we know that Lyndon Johnson wasn't always the great integrator. In his time in Congress, he was very much a segregationist. However, that may have been more a result of his party uh, and him towing the party line than what he truly believed himself. I don't know. What I do know is that he did work to get this across the finish line. And in his words, it cost him his presidency by doing that. Not the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Act is what cost him his presidency. And what we know that the Civil Rights Act of 1968 does is it prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, and national origin. We know that as the Fair Housing Act, of course. And here we have it, 1968, now we've eliminated housing discrimination, racism over in America, right? No, no. Of course not, of course not. We still have some challenges, but wait, we've got Jones versus Alfred, Alfred H. Mayer. This is a Supreme Court case. And what happened here is the 
Jones family, African-American family, wanted to buy a brand new home, new construction from Alfred H. Mayer. Mayer said, no, nope, ain't going to do it, can't do it. Uh, why couldn't he do it? Well, a couple of reasons. One, this was an FHA development. FHA was lending the money. And what did we just say about FHA? They ain't lending money in integrated communities. So he could not sell the Jones family a house. Even if he could, remember what the woman said 20 years ago, or it was probably, I guess, 11, 12 years ago. She said, I was, I understood that this community was white and I was happy to buy a home in the white community. This was the Levittown example that we talked about. So if Mayer sells the home to the Jones family, even if he could, he's broken the trust that this was gonna be a white community. And that might be the last house that he sells because once you break that trust, you know what happens. But at any rate, this case was argued at the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said in August of 1968, Mayor, you've got to sell the Jones family a house. Not only do you have to sell them a house, but you got to pay all their legal fees as well. So and there we have it. Now we've got proof that the civil rights bill works because the one from 1866 didn't get anything done because it didn't have any enforcement provisions. There were no enforcement provisions. And now that we see this enforced, it actually works. So now we've got all races, all colors, all religions, all national origins, holding hands, singing Kumbaya, um, you know, and that was all good unless you were a woman because it wasn't until 1974 that the Housing and Community Development Act was passed. And this amended the Fair Housing Act to include sex as a protected class. Now, you might be thinking, well, this was just an oversight, Nate. You know, you didn't, if, if, if 1974, I mean, that wasn't that long ago. They just wanted to clean up the legislation so it would be in there. No, 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 that's not what happened. This was vehemently debated. Um, in Congress. And this is what they said in Congress in 1974. We should not sell homes to women because women can perform the home ownership tasks that men can. So if we sell homes to women, they're not going to keep up the property. And as a result, housing values will go down. I can't make this stuff up. That's what they said. That's what they said. Um, and it, fortunately, it did not win the day because the Housing and Community Development Act was passed and it did um, in the Fair Housing Act. So now we've got, you know, all sex included, men and women, all religions, all of that stuff. Everybody's still holding hands, singing Kumbaya, unless you're in a wheelchair, because it was not until 1988. 1988, folks, I mean, talk about not very long ago. 1988 was really not that long ago. Um, Madonna had hits in 1988, and this added disability and familial status to the Fair Housing Act. This is the Fair Housing Amendments Act. Um, prior to this legislation passing, it was perfectly legal to tell someone, you know, your wheelchair scratches up my walls, I'm not going to rent to you. Perfectly legal. So, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, you probably have some challenges that other folks don't that aren't in a wheelchair. And then you're facing this type of discrimination. Paul Longmore said prejudice is a far greater impairment than any, uh, uh, far greater problem than any impairment. Discrimination is a bigger obstacle to overcome than any disability. So that was the challenge that we had coming up to 1988. Now, of course, we know that not all disabilities use a wheelchair and not all disabilities are visible. We have this issue today dealing with service and support animals. There's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad there. We have to figure that out because we cannot punish those that need the support and assistance of these animals just because there are some people that are misusing the policy and, and, and not acting in, uh, in an appropriate way. We've got to make sure that we keep an eye on that. So this was an example of a federal fair housing case. This was Anderson versus City of Blue Ash. The Anderson family uh, had a child and she had mobility issues, needed the use of a, of a horse to walk around the backyard and stay mobile. Uh, City of Blue Ash said no, no, no farm animals here in Blue Ash. This is a farm animal. So it went to court. The court said you must allow that horse. So as a result, you've got two animals that can be deemed service animals. That's a dog and a miniature horse. Um, and that's what we call a reasonable accommodation. 
Support animal can be anything. You can have a support gerbil, a support rabbit, a support snake. That's a different type of thing because a service animal performs a service, an actual duty, whereas a support animal provides a mental and emotional support. That's their, 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 their service, their duty. Uh, so then it's the familial status. Familial status refers to the presence or potential presence of a person under the age of 18 in the home. That's it. Uh, that's what familial status does. So that's where we're at today. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, and familial status. Those are our federally recognized protected classes. Our National Association of Realtors also recognizes two others, and that is sexual orientation and gender identity. So that's where we sit today. So at this moment, I will turn it back over and I would love to answer some questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Nate. We really appreciate it. Everyone, now we're gonna go ahead and transition to that Q&A segment where Nate will answer all of your questions. Um, and now it's not too late to submit your questions. So if you have one, please go ahead and put that in the chat for us right now or raise your hand and we'll be sure to get to you. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start with the questions in the chat. Actually, can we scroll up a little bit? I think there was another one. Yeah. Do you know how to scroll? Here, actually, let me see. One moment, guys. Okay, we're going to go with first. We the first question we have is at what? Uh, when did sundown begin? So the sundown towns were a response to um, legislation that had been passed. So for example, you have the, the, the Supreme Court decision about Shelley versus Kramer that was in the 40s. So we saw these sundown towns. It was not specific legislation, but it, was, it became popular in the wake of that Supreme Court decision. And also even more popular in the wake of the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 because we would see these sundown towns and these signs in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and even into the 90s in some communities. And today, uh, you know, I talk to people all over the country and they say, yeah, you know, I grew up and there was a sign that said that, you know, in front of the neighbor, in front of the, the town that I grew up in, or I know that I still can't go to this town after dark uh, because those policies still exist. And even though they may not be written, they're still, present with us today. Great. And when was the, the sundown time? Oh, the time. So when the sun went down, the, okay. when the sun went down. So that was the, that was the sort of policy. So when it gets dark, basically in that town, if you're a person of color, you better be out of there because that's when you're going to have problems. And so what that really did was it said that, okay, well, black folks can come, black and brown folks can come and work in the community, or, but they can't live there. So they can come and they can, you know, pump the gas or, you know, uh, you know, work in the grocery stores or whatever. But by the time, you know, the sun goes down, they better be out of there. Thank you, Nate. The next question, has the FHA ever apologized? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, has the FHA ever apologized? I'm not aware that the FHA has ever apologized for those policies. I know that there have been presidents that have apologized in the past for some of the discriminatory legislation, but I don't know if the FHA as a specific um, uh, um, uh, 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 jurisdiction or federal body has did actually uh, apologize. I'm not sure of that. Okay, thank you. Next question we have here, how do you address real life issues of often unintentional and unconscious bias? Can you give an example of a time that you had to address issues relating to fair housing in our industry? So in, ter in terms of, you know, when, when we're dealing with bias, we've got two types of bias. We've got the explicit bias where we know that we have um, a preference or aversion towards something or someone. And we have an implicit bias where we don't even know that this aversion or preference even exists. So that is very tough. And in terms of how I help deal with that, when I'm talking with realtors is I encourage them to implement the equal professional services model 
by the National Association of Realtors. Because one of the places where we can do the most danger is in steering and screening. Uh, so steering where, you know, someone says, yeah, I want to buy a house. And we say, OK, you'd feel more comfortable in this neighborhood versus this neighborhood. You know, for example, um, there was a um, Newsday had an investigative story. There was a three year investigation in Long Island, New York, and it concluded in November of 2019, I believe. And what they showed is that if you're Asian, you have a 19% chance of being shown homes in different neighborhoods than your white counterparts. If you're Hispanic, you have a 39% chance of being shown different homes. And if you're African-American, you have a 49% chance of being shown homes in different neighborhoods than your white counterparts. And I believe that some of that um, certainly not all, because you can watch the video, video, and I would encourage you to watch the Newsday video, because um, some of that is uh, intentional, explicit bias, and some of it is implicit bias, where you don't even know that you're making these decisions and that you're treating people differently. Uh, so that's where steering comes into play. You know, it's, uh, and then where the screening occurs is when people are calling and you're treating them differently based on how they sound over the phone, for example. So you amend your policy where you have a policy that you don't show anybody um, or, or you all of a sudden have a policy that you don't show anybody that doesn't have an approval letter because of the way they sound over the phone. And, you know, other people you've shown property and if asked, you know, and I've heard realtors say this, well, they just sounded qualified. Well, what does that mean? They sounded qualified, right? So that's implicit bias coming into play because you think that based on the way somebody sounds, that is an indicator of their financial qualifications. And if I were to ask, you would probably say, absolutely not. I don't believe that, but your actions show something different. And that's where the root of the implicit bias is. And that's why the implicit biases are so insidious because it's just like today. You know, there would be more people on this call, but there's so many people that say, I don't discriminate, so I don't need to go to this. And those are the folks that really need to be here. There's plenty of people, don't get me wrong, that are like, nah, I don't want that. You know, I don't, I don't want that. That's fine. But there's a majority of fo folks that say, I don't discriminate, so I don't have to be there. And those are the folks that have these implicit biases that they're not even aware of. And it's only through education and having these types of conversations that we can uncover what those implicit biases are and work to neutralize them. Awesome. And on that note, how can we as individual realtors hope to make a difference? Well, we can educate ourselves. I, you know, we can make a difference by educating ourselves and educating others. Uh, that's, I think, the biggest thing that we can do, because if you're in this room, you're on this call, you may have a commitment to learning more about some of these issues and working to create a positive change within your own community. So what has to happen is you need to take this information and take that knowledge that you're getting um, you know, during this journey of yours and expose other people to that, expose your family to it, expose your friends to it. And then that's how it spreads. You get that community spread in a positive way by sharing your knowledge with others and sort of counteracting those stereotypes by, um, you know, by uh, being intentionally inclusive. Because that's another thing, you know, with the education. Education is one thing, but then there's also how do our how does our association look? How does our board look? What does you know? Who, who do the people that I hang around with look like? And what we often find is those people look just like us. You know, they look just like you. If you're African American, you have a tendency to work with African American clients. If you're white, you have a tendency to work with white clients and have friends that match up with those features as well. So we all, regardless of your race, ethnicity, need to be proactive in reaching outside of our comfort zone to have these uncomfortable conversations and to be intentionally inclusive. Because if we're not intentionally inclusive, we're unintentionally exclusive. And by being exclusive, we end up not getting our communities to the sort of uh, the, the place where they should be and the place where they deserve to be and where we can help get them to. Wow, that's good stuff. 
Um, do you have any books that you can recommend that have helped to shape your opinions on this topic? Books. So yeah, there's countless books on the subject. So I, I'll share just a couple because I don't want to overwhelm um, everyone with, uh, you know, giving this laundry list of books to read. I think that The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein is a phenomenal book. It just came out maybe five years ago. Um, and he and he really does a very good job of explaining how our communities were sort of segregated by design. And it's a very uh, readable book and it's, uh, it's, it's done in a way that anybody can, it, it's accessible to anyone. I often will read books that are you know, for academics and it's like, eh, it's hard to get through. This is not that type of book. So The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, I would recommend also um, Living Apart, Living Apart by Nicole Hannah-Jones uh, is phenomenal as well. I would encourage you to check that out. And then The Color of Money, if you want to go a little deeper, The Color of Money by Mersha uh, Baradaran, a uh, phenomenal book too. And it really talks about the sort of history of how finances work in our country and it ties into real estate as well. But those first two specifically on real estate, you know, there's countless others. Um, the Case for Reparations by Ta-Nehisi uh, Ta Coates uh, is, is great. I would encourage you to read that. That's more of an essay. Um, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram uh, Kendi X is another good example of that, uh, of something that, you know, just from a sort of how do we create more inclusive communities point of view. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things. Uh, hopefully those, those are a few that, that, that you'll find helpful. Awesome. Thank you, Nate. And it looks like we have put a link in the chat box for everyone to uh, some uh, NAR books that are recommended for fair housing. So be sure to check that out. We do have a couple more questions that have come through the chat here. Um, what fair housing or DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion work has impressed you from around the country? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I'll tell you, Chicago, uh, Chicago Association of Realtors has done a lot of a, a lot of good things in terms of uh, making sure that that um, making sure that they're creating an inclusive community. They've identified each of the neighborhoods that they serve, and their challenge is to make sure that all of those neighborhoods is touched throughout uh, the course of the work that they're doing. Because one of the things that we see in realtor communities around the country is often there are parts of the community that are sort of overlooked or that, you know, we turn our backs on. And sometimes that's intentional, but most of the time it's unintentional. We're just not paying attention to it. So they've uh, made a, a concerted effort to reach out to those areas to do that. Um, another example is, in, is also in the Chicago area, the Main Street uh, uh, Association of Realtors. Uh, Main Street, um, they, uh, Main Street Realtors has done a lot of work in terms of, uh, you know, increasing uh, diversity and inclusion within their organization. And there's a difference between diversity and inclusion. When we talk about diversity, that's just having, you know, different types of people around the table. But inclusion is really about getting them involved and making sure that their voice is heard, valued, and welcome. Now, full disclosure, I do some diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting work for Main Street. So um, take that uh, uh, you know, as well. And then also California, the California Association of Realtors, they have a, um, they have a diversity and equity and inclusion officer uh, for the state, which really works to uh, Farrah Wilder. Um, she works to really make sure that they look at all of their programming through a uh, racial equity lens, because that's what often happens too, is that with diversity, equity, and inclusion, we've got, oh, we've got a diversity committee, they'll take care of that. But how this really needs to happen in, a, in, a, in an effective way is that every single aspect of the business of your association needs to sort of look through that lens and see how does this impact our diverse members or our diverse community and our diverse community. 
Also, my own association, my St. Louis Association of Realtors, I recently cha chaired a presidential advisory group to figure out what we could do in St. Louis to create better outcomes for our community because, you know, we know that we are the ones that created some of the challenges and sort of perpetuated the racial wealth gap that exists. So what we did is we came up with a dozen recommendations that we that we uh, delivered to our board of directors and the board of directors voted for every one of them. So they were all unanimously passed. And one of the important ones, uh, they were all important, but, but a lot of them couldn't be done without the hiring of someone specific to work on that. So we hired a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer at the St. Louis Association of Realtors to work on implementation of all the other things that this presidential advisory group um, you know, identified as ways that we can have a greater impact uh, in the neighborhoods that we live and work in. Thank you. Okay, a few more questions here. Let's see, so this one coming from the audience says, I mate, I recently had a black client whom I had multiple transactions with. He is a well-educated PhD and just transferred to another state. He wanted to live in a community with a greater Black and diverse community. How do we address this? Great question. Thank you so much. The reality is that it goes both ways. We can't answer that question. Um, we, you know, I, I, I can appreciate someone saying uh, that I want to live in a diverse neighborhood, that sort of thing. Now, I get that question from all races, and it's not the type of question that we can answer because we have done such a disservice to our country by the way that we have acted over the last hundred years in terms of how we've answered that question and what we've interpreted those questions to mean. So how we address that really comes down to, well, you know, I appreciate you wanting to live in a diverse neighborhood. However, I, you know, I would be a violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act for me to discuss the racial makeup of any neighborhoods. So what I would recommend that you do is take a look at, um, you know, take a look, you know, drive through neighborhoods, look online and, uh, and, and, and discover the sort of, and sort of work to understand the, if the neighborhood meets your definition of diversity or safety or whatever the case may be, because it's just not something that we can talk about. Great, thank you. Next question, how are you, if you've had to, handling being treated differently when you are a person of color? I have been on that end. Well, um, so how do I, how do I handle being a, treated differently by, be, by being a person of color? So I've got a, you know, so, um, you know, the easy answer is that I'm black every day and I've been black all my life, right? So it's just kind of a way of life. But the reality is that my black experience is different than someone else's black experience or someone else's uh, being a person of color experience. They're maybe Asian or Hispanic or what have you. Uh, for example, my wife, you know, I'm light skinned African American. My wife is dark skinned African American. We have different experiences to this day as it relates to how people interact with us. And um, we can attribute that to the color of our skin. Um, so for me, what I like to do when I know that I'm being treated differently is try to understand and educate people. Because I think that when we judge, um, I think that that's where we lose. Because by judging, we're basically eliminating the opportunity to have a meaningful conversation or discussion. And if we eliminate those opportunities, then you know how, how much better are we the next day? We're not, we've lost the chance. We've lost the opportunity to have the conversation. But if we look to understand where this person is coming from, what leads them to treat people a different way, then maybe then we can educate them away in a way that's going to um, you know, maybe create different experiences and different uh, relationships moving forward and hopefully create a different level of understanding for them because that's really what it's about. It's about education, uh, understanding, and, and you know, acceptance, because that's, if we don't have those things, then we're gonna have a tough time really connecting with each other. Um, so 
you know, I, 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 I don't know if I answered the question exactly how you intended, uh, but that's kind of how I think about when I'm treated differently. Another thing is, um, and this is just me being a human being, is that it is exhausting. You know, it's exhausting to address all of these situations because sometimes you know you're treating, you're being treated different than someone that doesn't look like you, but you don't have the energy to be able to confront that situation at the time. So you leave and you just move on with your day because it can be exhausting. If I dealt with, or if I, if I confronted every single interaction that I ever had where I felt I was being treated differently because of the color of my skin, then I wouldn't really be able to get a whole lot of things done because I would spend so much time doing that. And it, it just, it drains energy. And as I said earlier, I do believe that most people are good at heart and I do want to think the best of people and I can't exist in a space where I'm feeling that everyone is against me. And because then I'm not able to, um, I'm, not, I'm not able to show up as the best version of myself to talk with people about some of these issues, um, groups such as yourself uh, or my friends and family or people that I interact with and also educating and learning myself, which is a constant process because this is a journey that we're on. It's not, I've achieved, you know, uh, ec uh, diversity and inclusion. It's, I've learned more. What more did I learn today that I didn't learn, that I didn't know yesterday? So it's constantly an evolution in terms of this, in terms of this journey that we're all on uh, to sort of get to a space where we're having a greater understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right, absolutely. Thank you so much, Nate. And we have time for one more question from the chat, and then we're going to go ahead and conclude. The last question is, how do you define equity, and how can equity be moved forward in Arizona? How do I define equity? Um, so equity is different for different communities and different situations. And because really is, you know, because to me, equity really means, it really means does everyone have the opportunity to succeed or to achieve the outcome that's in front of you? So for example, there are some folks within your community that need certain things in order to be able to achieve that outcome. There are other people that don't need things. There are other people that need different things. So what we have to do is identify what each individual needs or each individual community needs in order for them to all arrive at the same place, have the opportunity to arrive at the same place. Because what we know is that it, all things being equal, not everybody's going to be equal because we perform differently in different spaces. There's people that are going to excel and people that are going to, um, uh, people that are gonna flounder. That's the reality. But when we talk about equality, it's not that everybody's equal, it's everybody has the opportunity to excel. And that's where equity comes in. And it means something different for different people in different communities. And it's important that we educate ourselves so that we can truly understand what does this community need that's going to create an equal opportunity for them to compete with everyone else. And that's equity, is giving them the tools to be able to compete on a level playing field with everyone else in the community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nate, for taking the time to answer these questions for us. And thank you for all the attendees for chiming in and being a part of the discussion. Before we conclude our presentation today, we'd first and foremost like to give a huge thank you to Nate Johnson for being here and sharing such an impactful presentation. Thank you so much, Nate. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. Thanks again. And before we say goodbye to everyone, we would love for you to save the date for the statewide DEI event, which will be on September 22nd, 2022. We'll have some fantastic speakers slated to speak. So far, we have Tim Hur, the area national president. Um, he will be there as well as Sylvia Seabolt, the Women's Council National Leader, 2022 national president. So we will have some more speakers as well to be confirmed soon. The panel session will be followed by a happy hour and the event is scheduled to take place at the CB Live at Desert Ridge. 
Registration will be at 3.30 p.m. There will be more details and information to come over the coming weeks, as, long, as well as a registration website for you all as well. Okay, and so to all of the attendees on behalf of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee at the Arizona Association of Realtors, we thank you all so much for joining us today for Focus on Fair Housing. We hope you all have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye now. Thank you, Nate. Thank you.